When a rock star is found dead inside their home, the crime scene investigation unit discovers a miniature replicating the exact same crime scene they are collecting the evidence from. Once all of the suspects are cleared, the killer will be free to strike again and again, leaving a miniature replica of each crime scene behind. With no apparent motive or victimology, how do you catch a serial killer? This is the story of the miniature killer. I'm gonna get no This is a good week on the BAM network, okay? Finally, we will reach episode 100, okay? It's going to happen. It just needs my voice for it to be recorded. I thought of recording it a few days ago, and that didn't go according to the plans. So it should come through to you on a Friday. But before that, in the Minnesota fashion, I'm going to drop you into one of my favorite, probably the favorite, fictional plot on a TV show. I am so obsessed with this. I don't know how many times I have watched CSI episodes portraying the miniature killer, but let's just say it was more than once. Let's just say that I'm the serial watcher of this plot because it is just so impeccable. And if you know and have been following this podcast from the very beginning, and especially from the beginning of the minisodes, you know I have already covered the story of the mother of forensics, uh, Frances Glasner Lee, and her dioramas, her miniatures, and how they have been used to solve crime and how now they're in the museum, all of that, okay? If you haven't listened to that, I'll put a link in the description to that episode. I'm fascinated by just the concepts of miniatures. And again, I'm so fascinated how this was included into the plot, like how much work must have gone for just this one single plot. So let us go right in. The show that I'm dropping you in is CSI, as I have probably mentioned. And the episodes covering this are from like season seven, eight, and then one, I think, episode from season nine. So the team has been called upon a scene one evening. And some of them are in a bar because obviously there's like other things that are going on. So some of them are found in the bar, some are getting drunk at home. And then the night team has been called onto the scene where they go to this rock star's home and this man has been found eating food. So there's a plate on the table. So the plate with the leftover food is on the table and their head seems to be slumped over it. But this is not what we see first because the camera work is so great that you see that same crime scene portrayed inside of a miniature. So you see the zoom in on this miniature figure just being slumped over the table, the food on the plate is exact, and every single other object belonging to that room, so like the kitchen and the dining room, is replicated inside of that miniature. From the type of like the wash that is on the sink, from the type of bleach from what is in the drawers, from the things that are on the wall, like this man's rewards, every single little thing. So Grissom, who is inspecting that miniature at first, while other people are taking pictures of the crime scene, is zooming in on all of these little bits. And he is wondering what came first, the murder or the building of this miniature? Because it is clear by this point that it represents the crime scene. Grissom's right hand, Sarah Seidel, is on the scene as well. I just wanted to utter that one day on microphone. I just wanted to put that into the universe. Because if you are in the CSI fandom, I don't think you ever fully vouched for this relationship. Because I was so confused when I watched this show when I was younger. I was like, why is there no chemistry within this team? It was such a great show in terms of like the actual forensics and like how they collect evidence and the details in everything like you see that they put so much work into it but the chemistry of the team was just never fucking there but Grissom and Sarah relationship I just it just never occurred to me that it will deserve a spin-off but somehow it did because CSI is back like in the CSI Vegas form 
and it is literally just like the two of them. I think the other members of the team are included. But just tell me, am I crazy? If you have watched CSI, did you ever see the chemistry between these two people? Because, and I never like look for personal lives of the victims, but from the moment I saw Sarah Seidel, I was like, I don't think she likes the, the, the genitals that you have, Grayson, you know, <laughs> so professionally said by, I think she would want, you know, maybe like some of mine, but I don't think she's into deal with my man. I just don't see it. And then he is like the most asexual person on this show. And I was like, I'm not buying into this relationship. Anyways, plenty of people probably did. They had to have like some chemistry on the team if for nothing else, for this singular plot. So Sarah is there and she's taking pictures of the scene and she notices the blood pool on the crime scene. And at that moment, Grissom also zooms it in on this particular miniature. And then they realize that it is impossible to match a blood pool this way unless the miniature was already made, it was then placed on the crime scene and then this blood splatter came possibly with the victim's blood right after the crime. Because there is no way of predicting it. So somebody actually even brought pipette or whatever it would be in order to collect the real blood and then replicate that on the miniature. From Sarah and Greg, who is another member of the team just taking pictures of the crime scene, we learn that the victim's name is Izzy Delancey. He lives in a nice gated property and they noticed that there was no sign of forced entry anywhere. From how he is placed, we know that he was only struck once in the head. And Greg, who is taking pictures of the bedrooms and other rooms in the house, notices this kind of like board where, you know, you can pin down the pictures. And he notices the picture of Annie and Izzy. So he's like, okay, maybe he has a wife. But then as he glances with like one of those lights that reveals, you know, spermies onto the bed, he notices that there was no sexual activity. And I have screamed when I have rewatched this now for this research because that is a huge indicator of something, isn't it? Like that we have just missed as a clue. I'm not going to spoil everything, but this is a huge indicator. If you're into true crime or fake crime, you probably know where this is going. So there was no sexual influence, but no forced entry. Who, who is this perp? What does it tell us about them? They will, however, reasonably so, based the whole suspect list on this no forced entry thing, right? Because no forced entry means that maybe the person had the access to the house. As they're questioning Izzy's wife, they learn that the list of people who have had the access to the house is much longer than they all expected. So the housekeepers, the gardeners, the pool guys, they would all have the gate code. And Madeline, the wife, suggests to them that they should question Sven, who was Izzy's son from the first marriage, because apparently they didn't have that great of a relationship. And then we are pulled back out of that scene of the interrogation and we go back to the crime scene where Greg is still looking for spermies, but now he's looking for spermies in Sven's bedroom and he finds that there is presence of some sexual intercourse there. Meanwhile, downstairs, Grissom is zooming in on that miniature even further because he has noticed from the crime scene that the bleach has been used to try to clean up the blood. But it wasn't done successfully, like they could immediately spot it, like it seemed like the killer might have been in a hurry. But where is the bleach? Like the rest of the scene is impeccable, everything is portrayed. So he opens one of the small drawers in that miniature. And this is where he finds bleach and he also sees a rolling pin. And the small rolling pin inside of the miniature's drawer has some markings of blood stains on it. So he opens the real drawer inside of the real kitchen and what do you know, he sees both the bleach and the rolling pin. And when he points luminol onto the kitchen surfaces, he notices so much blood in the kitchen sink, on the counter, so it seems like the bleach has been used 
but it doesn't seem like the real purpose of it was to actually get rid of all of the blood because this person can't be so impeccable and like detail oriented when it comes to the miniatures but then leave all of those pieces and like leave so much blood on the scene so it seems like there is a different kind of fixation there Meanwhile, the police interviews Sven, who I don't know who he is played by, but I'm pretty sure I have seen this guy somewhere. Listen, all of these people have started either on SVU or CSI. So Sven is supposed to be this glum, rebellious teenager. So he's just saying, you know, yeah, he just spends some time, yes, at his dad's house. He has the access to it. He does homework there, plays some games. He didn't see his dad, though. And then his mom, so Izzy's first wife, comes to the scene. She's pissed that they have actually fingerprinted him, that they are even considering him to be a suspect. But she also doesn't have, like, the most solid alibi ever, because she says that while Izzy was being murdered, she was just out walking. And this is kind of, like, one of the shittiest alibis. I mean, I would say it would be shitty if she was just to pull out a receipt out of her freaking pocket, because that is suspicious as fuck. Never do that. Never keep receipts. Okay, or maybe do. <laughs> it's just suspicious in my head, and everybody else is like, keep receipts of everything. But yeah, she doesn't have the most solid alibi either. The police still isn't discarding the family as the suspects because all of them had the access to the house. None of them really has a solid alibi. And also, all of them would have the motive to kill him. The son would end up inheriting the music rights, but then the mother would be getting them because the son is still a minor, so he won't inherit them until he is of age. And then also could be a stepmother because she could fight it and maybe win that over in court. So still, each and every person has a lot to gain here. But the plot twist comes with the autopsy of Izzy's body, because here they discover the cause of death was indeed blunt force trauma to the back of the head, and the death was quick. But the x-ray of the body reveals that there is a key a bumblebee brand key that was found inside of his chest, meaning that at some point he had swallowed it. And that point could have been a few days or a few minutes before his death. They can't really determine the exact moment when the key was swallowed. So bumblebee, which was probably imprinted on the key, I don't know how detailed these x-rays can be, but hey, he at least swallowed the key on the right side. So they see that this is Bumblebee key, and it links to the safe company. So the key that he swallowed belongs to a safety box. While all of this is happening, apparently this autopsy on TV shows, as always, lasts for like a couple of seconds, you know, it's totally realistic as fuck, because Greg is still on the crime scene, okay, he still has not moved, he's still doing his one-day tour, so he goes onto the shitter, right, because that is where you gain perspective. So he sits on the shitter and then sees like a remote control kind of thing on there, and he's like, um the fuck is this for? There's no TV on this shitter. And as he presses a button, well, something pops up underneath his feet. A safety box that he kept on the shitter, which is such a Maya move. I appreciate it so much. And here, inside of this safe, he finds a casino contract with Izzy's name on it. He also finds a wedding picture and a box that has a chicken head inside of it. Like a real chicken head. It's actually gross. I was like, where is this going? This plot is all over the motherfucking joint. Now the plot thickens, because if you remember the picture on the board in Izzy's room, the woman on it was called Annie. And this woman is the nanny of the family. I don't really know how that works, because the son is literally a teenager, but sure, he needs a nanny. And most likely Izzy needs that nanny for other purposes as well. So they look into Annie's room, because rich people keep nannies inside of their house, and they find pictures of similar kind of boxes on her computer, the, the chicken stuff boxes. Yeah. Greg also opens the laptop in Annie's room and he sees the correspondence between Annie and this tabloid magazine where Annie was supposedly getting paid to send some private family pictures 
to the editor for the money. So the money seems to be the motivation for all of these people. And when the legend that is Sarah Seidel goes through this magazine's website, she comes across the picture of Izzy's dead body slumped over the kitchen table. And the person that called them in the first place, they called 911, and then they called CSI onto the scene was Annie. So at best, she appeared on the scene, took the pictures of a crime scene and shared them with the tabloid magazine. And at worst, she is the actual killer. Spoiler alert, she is a... <laughs> what was that? Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert, she isn't the miniature killer. They questioned her and they realized that she just really wanted the money. Annie does give them a couple of dirty details, such as her and Izzy were the ones that were doing the deed in Sven's bed. That is why the spermies were there, which is just disgusting. Why would you... If I found out that my parents ever did it, or that my mom is ever doing it in like my own bed, I'd be like, no. This is not, I am disowning you. Then and there, disowning you straight up. This is like desecration of my identity, okay? Well, this isn't happening in real life, my okay? This is a fictional plot, so shut the fuck up. She also told them that Izzy was fighting with his wife, his current wife, about how she's a gold digger, she's only looking for money. So this is during this fight that he swallowed that safety key. And then she got his x-rays somehow and then went to the locksmith in order to get the copy of that key i don't know what this locksmith is like but he probably isn't the smartest person in the town because he does make a copy of the key that he sees on an x-ray and then she broke into his safe and found those beaten off chicken heads so how the fuck do these beaten off chicken heads fit into that story well, that is the brilliance of this show, because we don't learn this until very, very far from now, which is literally like you would forget about this detail. That's why I'm getting you not to forget about it. So Sarah inside of her little office is kind of digging online. So she found that tabloid thing and she also found some behind the scenes video. And in this video, it is said that Easy was married to Dusty, but the marriage was a sham, his first marriage, because it apparently it wasn't legal in the US. So they go to speak to his first wife, and his first wife is in a rush, she wants to get out of there, and she tells them she has an alibi, she was with his second wife at the coffee shop, trying to get her to convince Izzy to sign the contract. And, you know, she's like, yeah, you let yourselves out. And while they're there, they inspect certain 3D prints, like different diagrams, different detailed models of buildings. And these seem to be Sven's. So they're definitely thinking Sven has enough of a talent to actually make those miniatures or to model them at least. So they bring Sven back in and they show him the miniature and then they show him the pictures of his dad slumped over the table and at the sight of blood Sven fades and this was the worst acting scene in this whole freaking episode I loved it so much he literally just sits in the chair and like kind of slumps his head to the side and closes his eyes I was like this isn't even fainting my man you literally just had a shut eye, what the fuck? And then like a few seconds later, he just wakes up from it. I was like, really, we, we are buying into this. Like he just, what, slumped his head at the sight of blood? Well, they do a whole ass test on him. Like they put him on a freaking gurney and do like this blood test or whatever to find out is this actually feasible. And apparently he does. He has whatever disease it is that he actually faints at the sight of blood so it couldn't have been him because that means he would have sat down and slumped his head <laughs> over to one side and had a shot eye for a couple of seconds if he was the killer and with this they're out of suspects people either didn't have the skills to actually commit it because the killer was also the person that made the miniature they know that for sure just by how detailed it was and by the inserting of the real blood on it. Either people had the alibi or they fainted at the sight of blood. None of the family members seems to have actually done this. So Grissom is back in his lab. He's inspecting that miniature even further. 
And he is using this magnifying scope. Like they have all of these. It's not literally just like a magnifier. It's like these little things that can zoom in even further. And on one of the miniature pictures of Izzy that is like on the walls, as he lifts it up, he realizes on the back of the picture, there is a part of a doll's face. And this doll has the blood on her forehead. So Grissom just looks up after seeing this, thinking, what can this mean? Because it is intentionally there for me to find it, but what does it mean? And he will, just like the chicken heads, not find the answer to that until a long time from now. We are brought in on another crime scene. This is literally like after they have solved a quite a few cases so it seems like whoever this person is obviously needs enough time to plan out a murder and then prepare the whole new miniature because we see this lady older lady i would say take a couple of sips of her drink and then light up a cigarette and after that it seems like she's in a scuffle with somebody who might have broken into her house And the next thing, we see her head fly through a window. And this is where she exhales her last breath. And somebody rings the CSI unit yet again. Grissom and Sarah are on this scene, which you're like, wow, that's good, because they are now familiar with this pattern. But there isn't a pattern yet. There's no miniature found on this crime scene as of now. And Sarah immediately notices that the coupons, because this seems to be one of those coupon ladies who were just having her bath and the cigarette while cutting them out of the newspapers, okay? It's the Mama June of the victims. Mama June isn't a victim in real life, Maya. She might be actually a perpetrator, as you have already covered on this channel. Listen, couponing addictions are real addictions, okay? I'm not making fun of that. <laughs> is going on so sarah as she's examining the scene she notices these coupons that were scattered on top of the broken glass and that to her means well the killer has killed this woman there was a scuffle she ended up head first through the window and then they stayed behind for whatever reason And for that to make sense this woman as she was drinking her beverage and having her smokes Well, she was also cutting out the coupons. You know, it is a typically American thing, but it is also a whole less addiction. Like, there is enough basis for couponing to become a plot of a movie with, like, Kristen Bell, I think, and whoever else. So, um, you know, it's a problem. If you can make a whole less movie about it, it's an addiction, America. Own up to it. Wow, you really had an agenda today, didn't you? So... As they're looking through the rest of the house, they in the bedroom find this bottle of lorazepam on the nightstand. And then when they open the drawer, they see it full of these prescription pill bottles. There are these poker chips on the bedstand. There's even more pills on the other one, even more pills in the second drawer. And this matters because once the body goes to autopsy, they realize that the cause of death was her bleeding out due to the sharp forced trauma to the carotid artery, meaning that, you know, once she was pushed through the window, this is how she died because of the glass being stuck into her throat. However, the autopsy technicians have examined her lungs as well. And they realized that she has had tumors, meaning that she was going to die anyway. So immediately Grissom and everybody hearing this know that there was supposed to be some sort of pain medication inside of that house. And none of those pill bottles were pain meds. Back at the house, because yet again, we have established by now, these are some of the quickest autopsies ever done. It is totally doable, okay? I just want, you know how Wired does like morticians describing XYZ TV shows or like lawyers telling you, you know, how unrealistic suits is, things like that. Wired does have a YouTube channel where they like post a lot of things. I watch usually the mortician ones. I don't know, it just fascinates the shit out of me. And the guy is like super adorable. Well, I just need the autopsy 
Prophecy Technicians. The Ask a Mortician one would be such a great, the, the popular YouTube lady. Put her on Wired to answer all of the questions about autopsies and like how they actually don't take like a goddamn 60 seconds <laughs> to accomplish while people are still on a crime scene, okay? Because I just think this needs to be related <laughs> to so many people. But here, of course, this is super realistic. So while still at the crime scene, they're following the pieces of the broken glass to the back door. So possibly this is where the killer exited the crime scene. Then Sarah finds another bloodied piece of glass close to the grass and she walks over to this hole that seems to be in a fence and takes a picture of it. And just in that moment, Penny, the victim's nephew, comes over with some groceries to visit his aunt and she goes to meet him in front of the house and tells him, well, your aunt is dead. Then they bring him to the police station. They interview him and they notice that he has some marks on his arms, kind of insinuating that he is a drug user. He admits to it. He says he hadn't used drugs in a while and he wouldn't have taken the pain meds from his aunt, you know, to support the drug user, the withdrawals, because his aunt was the one to take him in once his parents kicked him out. So... You know, he was just visiting, sort of buying her groceries, helping her out because she helped him out. So they process his clothes, his shoes. They don't find any blood, which he would have definitely had on them walking over the bloody shards of glass. And they also do the drug tests on his urine and that comes out negative. So where the fuck are all of the drugs? Next, the police officers look through CCTV footage and it shows the house across the road. It shows the neighbor's house. And this neighbor, you can see him coming out a couple of times per day to meet with these different cars. So they're like, okay, he's dealing some sort of drugs. So now they have a drug dealer and they have a drug user and they have just kind of discarded a drug user based on the physical evidence and the lack of drugs in his system. And when they interview the drug dealer, when they interview the neighbor from across the road, they suspect that he might have been using the drugs, the painkillers that were prescribed to Penny, in order to create the mix of drugs that were selling well on the market. But no painkillers were found inside of his house. Just as, yet again, they are out of suspects, the nephew arrives at the station, at the CSI station, holding a package that was left on his doorstep. And here, Catherine and Sarah look inside and they see a miniature crime scene, very similar to the one that they have found in Izzy Lance's house on his crime scene. And also, you have to wonder, why wasn't this miniature left on Penny's crime scene, is there anything that had to be finished? Like any finishing touches that had to be done? Both Sarah and Grissom are analyzing this miniature now and they just both know like no drug dealer or drug user would have had this patience. Also the fact that they sent it afterwards probably means like this person is even more of a perfectionist that we thought they were because they weren't satisfied with it or why else would they have not left it on the exact crime scene? As they're zooming in onto this model, Grissom of course finds a pillow and this pillow has a picture of a bloody doll on it. The blood splattered over the doll's forehead. So that seems to be just another angle on the same doll judging from how it was displayed. As they are inspecting it, they both agree there's nothing in common between their victims. So they don't think that they have still met a person responsible for it, because in both situations they have cleared all of the suspects. And as Grissom holds that miniature up and kind of just like tries to inspect it from different angles, he hears a noise. It seems like the miniature has a rattling sound in it. So he's like, Sarah, Seidel, love of my life, legend, can you go back to the crime scene? Because there's something hidden somewhere there. And we see it where it's hidden in the miniature, and then we see where it's hidden in real life. Because Sarah goes to the crime scene, she goes into the garden, and there is a rock that was displayed 
on the miniature as well. And under that rock, there is the syringe of fentanyl, the painkiller drug that everybody was looking for until now. Since the drugs were found, now both the drug dealer and the drug user turn into witnesses rather than suspects. Because they all want to know, have they seen anybody go in and out of the house? Have they seen anybody maybe hide this fentanyl? And here, the drug dealer admits that he was the one buying it from this old lady. Because apparently she wanted to profit and she would get like $50 for each fentanyl syringe that she was to sell him. We see a flashback of them making this deal. And the nephew admits that, yeah, he kind of knew that his aunt was selling drugs because she had other addictions. She was addicted to online poker. Then liquor, cigarettes, you know, everything that would have eventually killed her. But still, it wasn't what killed her. And in order to find out what was, well, Grissom is inspecting that miniature even further. And upon inspecting the miniature doll that is placed through the window, just like as the real victim was, he realizes there is glue on the back of the doll. And then he goes to the chair and he sees traces of glue to the chair, meaning that the killer inspected for Penny to die in the chair. So for Penny to actually die in her chair, something that she was to consume would have to have been poisoned. And he tries to pick up the small liquor bottle from the floor and he can't because the bottle is glued to the floor. So this is how the victim was supposed to be killed. Grissom relays this information to Hodges, who was another lab technician, for him to test the bottle. And inside of that liquor was some nicotine. So she didn't smoke it, rather she drank it. And because of the amount of nicotine that she has taken in through both cigarettes and that alcohol, she would have experienced convulsions. So due to this, she stood up, probably tried to fight it, maybe go for water or anything. And then she was just staggering around and suddenly fell right through the window. But this is not what the killer had expected. They didn't know that these would be the effects of nicotine on this lady. So they had to fix the original crime scene. And that is why the miniature came a lot later than the crime. This, you would think, might lead somewhere. But this kind of nicotine is just available to anybody to purchase and then put it apparently in a drink. I don't know how, but somehow it is. But there are two other things that happen at this time that might actually do lead them to their killer. One of them is that going through the phone records from both Izzy's and Penny's phones, they find out that they had had 10 numbers in common, one of which is apparently from this untraceable, disposable cell phones, one of those burner phones. But that is weird, isn't it? Like two completely different people, two different backgrounds have something at least in common. And then they also inspect the footage from the neighbor's house. And this footage is super grainy, as it always is, which is the most realistic thing probably in this whole S show. But they see a picture of a man, well, rather the back of a man, putting the miniature crime scene on Penny's doorstep. And they don't see any delivery truck, they don't see a vehicle, but there seems to be a logo on the shirt of that person's back, so they still need to zoom in in order to find out, potentially, the company that was delivering this that might lead them to the killer. As that is still in processing, the team is called to yet another crime scene. This time, they are called to a chicken processing plant that is called Manly Chickens. And this guy who was working a night shift called Raimundo, he was working between 8 p.m. and 4 a.m., was found in a basin, like where they wash the chickens before they were actually to process them. And he is found face down in a stun bath. I know it's down what it's called because I don't truly understand it. <laughs> so I had to like note down what the fuck this thing does. Apparently in this stun bath you would stun the chickens before they go into the next room. So you use electric current in water which is just diabolical. 
on the next level, but hey, it happens in this fictional plot, so I don't want to look up if it happens in real life. I just, I just don't. And this current is supposed to stay off overnight, so this man was just supposed to be cleaning and definitely wasn't supposed to, like, switch it on and experiment with it. And also, he's lying down in about three inches of water, so it would be impossible for him to lie down, switch it on himself and commit a form of suicide in that way. However, Grissom does note that if the current was on and he was to hit the water, even if it was accidental, like he just slumps over the wrong way, his muscles could have contracted and then that would have made it impossible for him to get out. But the machines are kept off during the night, so somebody else has to be behind it. And also just by how the body has been found, like his whole body was sprawled in this basin, this didn't seem like an accident, like him just sleeping and possibly falling into that basin. As Brass and other detectives are interrogating people that worked on the chicken processing farm, they find out that Raimundo was actually sleeping with a boss's wife. So, of course, somebody again has a motive. And Greg, who literally seems like a fucking pervert in this plot, but no, I love Greg. Greg is great. Greg is inspecting the area where they found the body and he finds a condom just like on the floor. A used condom, may I add so. So he's like, oh, maybe he had like a chicken fetish. But it corroborates the first story, that the man was having an affair with the boss's wife, and that's why he worked the night shift, and that's where he had an affair. However, Grissom finds a box that was just tucked in the corner of the room, and as soon as he removes the lid, he finds another miniature. So they can yet again probably exclude all of the other suspects, because this seems to be the work or one person who, at this point, is a serial killer. By now, Grissom kind of knows what to look for here, and he immediately looks for some form of picture that he can then lift up, and on the back of it, he knows he's going to find the same doll. So it seems like these are three different views of the exact same doll, like a porcelain doll, with the blood splattered over her forehead. And here, he finds it in the small window on the door. And by this point, it seems like this kind of doll matters to the killer, that it is a form of signature, because it doesn't actually belong to the crime scene, so it is something that stands out. And it seems like it is important, like it portrays the killer rather than the victim, and how the killer sees themselves or something that they are actually fixated on. They yet again think that there is no similarities between the victims. Sarah has in the meantime looked at the burner phone calls from the first two victims and she tracked down the store where the phone was bought but was paid in cash, so that led nowhere. However, this is when she discovers a commercial done by Izzy, which is the first victim the rock star, speaking about chicken cruelty and speaking about a manly farm. He actually seems to have even hired this undercover investigator who was recording the conditions on the farm, like people stomping on chicken. And of course, after that, after this famous person completely exposed them, well, their stocks dropped over 60%. They had to go into damage control mode and launch the PR campaign, and they have never really recovered from it. So finally, there is some connection why the small chicken heads were found in this man's house, in the safety box. Like, is there a connection between the two of them? could have the owner of the manly chickens actually been responsible for the murder of Izzy's. They interrogate the boss, he was supposedly aware of the affair of his wife, and he of course knew who Izzy was, but he lawyered up, and it didn't seem like he was the one responsible, again because of the miniature aspect. And at this moment, finally, that footage from the second crime scene, the CCTV footage of the logo of the back of the shirt, is being enhanced. And they discover that the logo is of a train. And it's not just the train, but it is the logo for a locomotive wheel. 
And Locomotiveville turns to be one of those websites slash shops for the train aficionados, for people who want to have like a full ass train with the rails, just like going through their house and want to buy from the people that actually make them, you know, the hobbyists, so that it's not just like a typical toy. Listen, people are into all sorts of weird fucking things. And here we zoom in onto the owner of that website and that workshop, onto his house. And we see different trains going through it. And then we see different miniature figurines without heads. So many miniature molds around, figurines of everything under the sun, from just random people passing by to all of these different professions in miniature form to quite literally the devil and the aliens, again, in these miniature molds. Because they had a warrant to collect these different molds from the crime scene, they bring them back to Grissom. And he starts filling them up and finds the exact one, the exact pot, from which the Easy Delancey's model came from. So, of course, this means that this man has the mold where one of the victims came from in the miniature form. So they bring him in and he admits that the mold did belong to him and he says he wants them back. So they're like, mate, you're literally like the prime suspect. <laughs> the only person who could have actually done this, these miniatures out of everybody that we have interrogated so far. But he says he doesn't know these victims. He knows a lot of people who have this different shirt, a lot of people who are into these kind of hobby shops. And in terms of how did his work end up on three different crime scenes, well, he's been making these miniatures and these train models since he was nine. He sends it to these hobby shops, he sells those over the internet to hundreds of people who could have bought them from him. And then used it in a crime scene. They don't have enough evidence linking him to these crimes, so they have to let him go. And just as they do, Sarah walks in and tells Grissom there were additional minutes on that phone that we can connect to at least two victims that were purchased by Ernie himself. So now they have some crucial evidence. The squad surrounds his house and just as that happens, Grissom, inside of his office, gets an email. And as he opens it, it literally says, like, I confess to the murders of everybody. And then there's a video. But this video is a live feed. And in this video, Ernie is just sitting down in his workshop, drinking a cup of tea. And he is saying he makes things, he fixes things, he's a handyman not really a sociable type, because if you spend time around people, you will get your heart broken. And then, without them expecting it, just as you hear the squad above trying to reach into the workshop, he takes a gun and just blows his brains out on camera. And then we see the squad going in. So, case closed, right? At least in this series. They move on to other cases. Grissom goes on a sabbatical for about a month. And just as he does, he goes into his office and sees a miniature on his table addressed to him. So, he asks how long this has been sitting on his table and realizes it has been for weeks. So Catherine, another member of the team, walks in and he asks her, did anybody work a scene like this in the past four weeks? And she says, no, but I'll check like with the morning team. And he says, no need, because he has zoomed in on the edition of the newspapers inside the miniature and the edition is dated to the day after tomorrow. So now they have just about 48 hours or less to figure this miniature out. Now, most of the team is in on it because, of course, there's a time limit and also they need all hands on deck to inspect the miniature and also to look at Ernie's confession because they thought that they have caught their killer. And as they're re-watching the confession, Sarah is like, well, Ernie was either directly or indirectly related to each scene, meaning he must have some personal connection to somebody. If he was ready to kill himself in order to protect another person, there must be some actual personal relation between him and the actual perp. And I was like, no shit, no shit. I was screaming, I was like, it is his child. It must be like his child. Look at the fucking children. Look at them. 
you have other members of the team who are looking at this from a different perspective. Like, what if it is a copycat? But miniatures were never released to the press, so it couldn't have been a copycat. But what if it is a partner? Like, you know, there are people who do this together. But no, they're too fucking detailed. Somebody is OCD, somebody is a perfectionist. This isn't a team job. And on top of that, as Grissom is zooming in on the pictures of the dolls, because now this is what he looks at at first, because it is quite a signature, right? Like a lot of people, probably the aficionados, these hobbies, like the people who are obsessed with stuff like this, could make a miniature. But in order for it to be the same person, they do leave a certain signature behind. So he finds the picture of that doll. And as he puts them under a light, like all of the pictures of those dolls, it spells out, you were wrong. So now they know for sure that they don't have the right person for this. As for the miniature, it looks like it is either somebody's office or a living room, kind of like a personal space. There's a couple of couches and the victim is lying on the main couch. And they have a pillow over their head. So when you lift the pillow up, you can see the mascara smudges, meaning that this person has probably died suffocated. So whether it is suffocated by this pillow or possibly by something in the room because there's smudges of mascara. So somebody either pressed it on their face. That is what they think first, right? And while Grissom is trying to figure out the modus operandi, while he's trying to figure out the location of where this crime is to take place, Sarah and Greg are going through Ernie's personal effects. So they found some home movies, like the VHS tapes, and they immediately go to watch them. Before they are to watch those tapes, Grissom seems to have found his next clue. He spots a cat hiding behind the bookshelf, like behind some of the books. And the cat seems to have some milk in their whiskers, and it also seems to be portrayed as dead. So Hodges walks into the room right then. He's another lab technician. And he says, oh, they have a cat, like I have a cat myself. And this is when it hits them. This must be somebody's house because cat is quite a house animal, a domestic animal. So you wouldn't really let it out or like bring it to somebody else's place. And the milk in the whiskers means like, okay, maybe they had an afternoon tea and both parties, both the woman and the cat were poisoned in such a way. Now they think they have the modus operandi. They think they know how the crime is going to happen. But when it comes to the location, and this is so mind-blowing. So they have the actual outline, like in the miniature, right? They see the windows, like they see everything replicated as it is. So they see how the pattern of it should look like on the outside. And then on the table, right next to the couch, Grissom finds a map. It is like a takeout map in the area and it gives you one of those like rough outlines of where the takeout is, where it just gives you like street names and then there's the X where the takeout place is. So this is great. Now they have the neighborhood and they have how the house is supposed to look like from the outside. Well, rather how the windows and the terraces are supposed to look. So they send people from their team in that neighborhood with like the printed out versions from the outside of that miniature to literally question everybody on the streets. And finally, the the guy with the blue eyes, the, the guy that I really crushed on, even though he was kind of ancient, even on the freaking show, one of the detectives, right? He spots it. He runs right there. He runs right in. He speaks to the receptionist of the house. And this guy does not freaking understand what the fuck is going on. So they show him the actual miniature. He's like, okay, this is how their flat looks like. You're trying to prevent a possible serial killer from striking again. React. And he says, oh, this is Mr. Stellman's flat. So they go right in. As they're walking into this woman's flat, the music is blasting. And they're like, oh, fuck, maybe we were too late. But nobody's on the couch. And this is where the crime should happen. Like We know that this person is obsessed with making those crimes happen exactly how they want them to happen. Finally, Mrs. Telman just steps out of the shower and she's freaked the fuck out. So they take her in and they ask her, like, do you take a nap usually around this time? Do you put a pillow over your face? 
And she's like, yeah, what the fuck is this about? Now, they bring her in and, of course, they're going to try to arrange this stakeout so that nothing happens to this woman and so that they potentially actually catch this killer who they now suppose is going to try to put poison into something. You know, going to try to poison, like, one of the drinks, possibly milk, so that both her and the cat die. And as that interrogation is happening in another room, the team is reviewing the VHS tapes. And they see Archie and some kids on the train. There's like a ton of kids. They're like, are all of these his? Are they foster children? What the fuck is going on? And the sound, even though it was enhanced, like you can't hear anything, is really bad. Then it jumps onto some birthday footage. There is a birthday cake and a son of some sort seems to be celebrating their birthday. There's three candles back then, so now the son would have been 24, but the kid smashes the cake and the camera never even zooms in onto this cake for us to find out the man's name. As these members of the team realize it will be a lot harder than they thought to identify all of these kids that they have been seeing on the train and at that birthday party, the other members of the team have conducted a toxicology report on Barbara and on milk and literally everything that they found in that house, and it seemed to have been negative for everything. So they know that this killer needs to realize their mission, so they will show up again. They decide to go for that decoy, to have one of their agents go and pretend like they're lying down at that exact time on the day that the crime was supposed to happen, to have the pillow over their head. And obviously to put a camera right on top of them so that they can see anything and anybody going in to catch the killer in action. And now the logic behind this is that, yes, maybe they won't be poisoned. Maybe the killer will do it personally, suffocating them with a pillow. But the killer was present on each and every scene of the crime. So they believe that the same thing is going to happen here. That they want to be there to ensure that everything is done the way that they intend it to. Everybody is watching this happen. They're watching this officer walk in, lie down, put the pillow on the face... They're watching everything, everybody going in and out of the reception. There is an inspector who is literally sitting at the reception, pretending to be flipping through the newspapers, looking at everybody going in. And they notice a man with a briefcase walking in, going right to that floor. And once he's right in front of the door, they tackle him down. They ask him what the fuck he's doing there. But they see on the ID as he confirms himself that he is the intended victim's brother. So they pull him away. They bring him into the interrogation. And they're still just observing this crime scene. And hours pass. So they're like, okay, hey, yeah, officer, it's time to just get up, I guess. But the officer isn't getting up. So another officer walks in and she's like, I mean, I know that you are shattered, that this nap worked well for you, but like, wakey, wakey. But the officer still isn't waking up. So they take that pillow off her face and they realize that she is dead. With her eyes bloodshot, just like the victim in that miniature. And this is when Grissom is zooming in on all those different parts, trying to figure out how the fuck... Did, despite of all of them watching this woman quite literally die, how did they do it? Because just as intended, the person on the couch wasn't the only victim. Once they move those books, they find that the cat has been poisoned, killed as well, because it is just frozen in space right behind those books, which is just so eerie. How the fuck do they know even where a pet is going to be inside of this crime scene? Now they are questioning Barbara and they're questioning her brother, so the intended victim and that brother that was in front of her door. And the brother is saying, well, she was actually a psychiatrist. Like There were a lot of people that knew where she lived. She doesn't practice it for time. But she did treat some sociopaths, like, she can't tell them anything because of the doctor-patient confidentiality. But then they ask her to inspect one of the miniatures, like, can you tell us just some characteristics that this person might have? Looking at it, Barbara says they are looking for somebody who is definitely OCD, has antisocial personality, but doesn't lack impulse control based on what she has seen. 
somebody who visualizes this, who really visualizes this crime scene, who takes this horror and the repressed rage and let the monster out of the box, quite literally, by putting all of their traumas and everything that they have gone through, probably by themselves, because they don't seem to have many friends, into this miniature, into that portrayal, and then take it out on the intended victim. Elsewhere, Grissom decides to actually open this miniature up because they would be as precise from the inside as they would be from the outside, which you have to wonder, why the fuck didn't you open it up before, my man? So they see the lungs are a weird color here. They see that the miniature's lungs were weird. So they do the autopsy report on the actual victim now, the officer that they have sent in, and they realize that the cause of death is carbon monoxide poisoning. And now you zoom in onto that CCTV footage that they have put in form of the stakeout, and you see the footage of the fire. So they sent Nick in, one of the other investigators, and he examines the fireplace. He notices that there was a whole contraption set up where a timer would go off that would activate the motor and some charcoal would drop off at the exact time and then the fumes would be released into the apartment. This could have been set up a month in advance while Grissom was still on his sabbatical. So that meant that there was no danger for this killer of being caught. They let Barbara and the brother go because now they believe that this person is safe. You know, this was how they intended to kill them and there is no further danger to them. And meanwhile, they focus on that son in those VHS tapes. So they find out that Ernie did have one single son, one single dependent, and this person apparently changed their name. So they go into the factory, they track him down, they find where this guy works, and he does say that, yeah, he didn't really have a great relationship with his dad, but after his death, it was a lot better. They don't get much out of the sun and it just seems like it might be another dead end. And just at that moment, Grissom is reminiscing on this. Like he's talking with other detectives who are still scarred because they have left this woman to die while they literally watched it on CCTV. And Grissom is stating like the miniature wasn't perfect because the right victim didn't die. Like for this killer, this does mean something. And just like that, they then get a call about the intended victim, that psychotherapist actually being found dead on that couch in the exact position, just taking her nap. But this time during her autopsy, they find water in her ear. So here they realize the killer must have done it the old-fashioned way, the way that they first suspected, by suffocating her with a pillow. But then accidentally they trip the vase over, and the vase spilled like the water onto Barbara's pants, and also then it somehow ended up in her ear while, you know, they picked it up trying to put it back onto the table. But that doesn't make much sense, does it? And not just that, but then looking at that vase... They find bleach inside of it. And apparently, when they look this up online, bleach in water, if it is in small doses in flowers, would kill bacteria and actually prolong the flower's life. But bleach seems to also have been found on each and every crime scene in some form. This is when we have two red herrings literally reveal themselves before our eyes. This is so freaking well done. Because in one interrogation, they interview the son, Ernie's son, Lionel, who came in for an interrogation, you know, despite of not being under arrest. And he told them that Ernie cared about his wife, his trains, and his kids, referring to the foster kids. And he cared about them in that order. He told them that his parents would take in dozens of foster children over the years, and that was because of the mom. The mom wanted the kids, and the dad wanted to please the mom. But after she died, the dad just didn't really care about his biological kid, and also about all of the foster kids. And in another room in autopsy department, we find out 
that Barbara had Parkinson's and she was on strong meds for it. And yes, on her pants, the water that was found from that vase did have bleach, but the water in her ear was biological, meaning tears. So the killer was crying. So we have her brother in the interrogation room again, and he is arrested because we find out that Barbara, his sister, told him that this is now a perfect opportunity for her to die the way someone else could be blamed and not her brother. And so he assisted her in her suicide. So he gets arrested because apparently there's no assisted suicide protection in Nevada where they are based. Just like that, this man seems to have been protecting someone he loved. Just like Ernie. And here we are to the root of our issue, to that VHS tape. We know that the judge would hate giving names out when it comes to the foster kids. They count 13 of them on the train. But as hard as it is, they have to work on it. Because a man killed himself to protect someone he loved. And that someone has so far murdered four people. And seems to have no intention of stopping. Suddenly, we are inside of a convenience store, and here a random janitor is just mopping a floor and accidentally knocks over this gallon of bleach. And as the bleach leaks into an aisle, a young woman starts storming out of that store, starts lagging it in panic. And when outside, it seems like she's trying to regain the composure screams inside because that was the clue from the very beginning we finally get a glimpse of who we will find out to be a miniature killer because the lack of sexual activity usually indicates that the perp is a female Anyways, we are back with Grissom inside of the wall of kids' faces. He has been working on it for weeks with the rest of the team, trying to track them down, trying to eliminate them. He found out a lead on one of them, that they died two years ago in some sort of bizarre accident. So they're like, okay, one less suspect. And just then, they get a phone call of another victim. It seems like somebody has died inside of their flat, inside of the toilet, and this person is the foster kid of Ernie's, so of course they have to inspect it. But there's no miniature left on the scene, just the doll of the person dying. On this crime scene, though, there is blood on the victim, but there's no blood on the doll. However, there is bleach, and they're trying to compare this doll with the other dolls from the crime scene to see if it comes from the same molds. Also, when Grissom cut the clothes off of the doll, he found a fingerprint on the back of it, which is something that isn't left behind in the past cases. So it seems like they are slipping up, or rather, they might are coming towards their endgame. We are back to our woman, the one that ran out after the bleach was spilled, and she is sitting inside of a waiting room, waiting for a job interview, just making some sketches. And yet again, when you look at one of her sketches, like all of them are of the previous victim. So by this point, we know that this woman is the killer. But her next one seems to be profile of Grissom, the main investigator in the case. I didn't catch that when I watched this like for five times. So I was like, okay, the clues were always there. It seems like it is the unfinished sketch. Just as she's doing that, she gets called inside. And we see that she's awkward, she's stuttering. This woman is making fun of her. She's just literally trying to get a job to clean someone's place. And this woman is saying like, well, you know, the future employees might need to take fingerprints, require a background check. Are you okay with that? And she, we will find out her name is Natalie, is just staring at her hands like fingerprints. And this woman is literally about to turn her ass down, be like, yeah, walk through this door, like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, I'm not even capable of doing this job. And at that moment, Natalie utters, I can memorize each room. You know, I have a photographic memory. I can tell you every single detail about each and every room. And she's like, oh, yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Um, Describe the waiting room that you were just in. And you see Natalie recall every single detail, like the little sweets inside of a jar on a table of the receptionist's desk. 
And this woman is impressed. She's like, oh my God, the shining future that you are going to have. Like, we might have options for you. Which I was like, how does this relate? She's supposed to clean, not like have a memory test. Like, the, why do you suppose that she will clean better if she has a memory of this? But it's just like, it doesn't make any sense. But I guess our girl Natalie got a job and we will soon find out where and how it connects to the rest of this case. But not before we find out about one of the foster kids, the one that they found dead, how he died due to the blood force trauma to the head. It seemed like it was once again up close and personal. And the results on that partial fingerprint don't show up in the system. Like She doesn't seem to be in CODIS. However, they finally know the chromosomes are XX, meaning they know the gender of their killer. And Grissom remarks how rare, you know, serial killers are rare. The ones with the delusional psychosis are even more rare. And yet we see one of them walking into one of those hobby shops. And she is saying she needs an order for that special something. We see a flashback with Ernie who is trying to face Natalie after the cops have been questioning him. And he says, like, the cops know that I helped you. So he asks her, have you killed all of these people? And she says, yes, she did. So he's like, okay, I mean, if you have a good reason... He knows that there are some people that deserve to be killed. But she doesn't really say anything. So he asks her to promise that she will stop. And he won't let the police get her. And you see kind of him like resonating what that really means. As in that he is going to need to take the fall for this in the only way that he can. So she promises that she's going to be his good girl, his special girl. And as that resonates in his head, he says, you were the one thing I thought I've done right. Meanwhile, in real time, now that they know they are dealing with a female, Grissom goes to another hobbies community's website. And here he directs the question to the community because on the last victim, on the miniature of it, they have found this personalized metal bracelet. And this bracelet seems to be really hard to make. So he is asking about anybody that they might be aware of on this community board that specializes in the miniature metal work. Because that seems like quite a niche. And he gets a response and just goes off. While that is happening, Nick, another detective, because now everybody here is on the case and Nick or like people who haven't worked at it from the beginning have that perspective of putting fresh eyes onto something. And here Nick notices, wait, like every single murder that this person, now we know a woman, has committed was disguised as something else. Like, we have lost a person because of it, you know, because we thought she's going to be poisoned through milk and it, in the end, ended up being, like, the fireplace. Every single one had that twist where they thought this is how the person died. The second victim, they thought, will be dying sitting in a chair, but that's not how it happened. So what if this is the same murderer, this has happened with Trevor's body, with a foster kid? He goes to the autopsy and they have already determined the cause of death here. But because of Nick, he says, like, can you re-examine it? And he is looking at this body with this autopsy technician, Doc Robbins. And he spots a little black spot on this man's foot. So he's asking the autopsy tech to look at it under the microscope to see if they have missed out on something. And two revelations now come about that completely change the course of this story. So Grissom is at this hobby shop that had rang him up. And he realizes that, yes, there was a woman called Natalie that paid in cash and she requested for something to be made for her, something specific. It was this battery-powered micromotor which is used to like animate the miniature, so to either make it move side to side or from top to bottom. They don't have the last name, but they have the phone number, and the phone number matches the records that they had from the previous crime scenes. And at that same time, Dr. Robbins, the autopsy technician, looking at the examination, like at the microscope pictures of that black spot, finds out that Trevor's cause of death was actually electrocution 
that there was a shock that sent him into the convulsions. So they sent the rest of the team to the spot to figure out where this shock might have come from. Nick and Catherine go to Trevor's flat and they find the crack in the sink, sort of like the burn mark. So they notice that the cables weren't wired properly. Which would mean that whoever tapped into the power did it from the apartment next door. So now they're like, oh my god, wow, how easy that would be. The killer just lives next door. Of course he doesn't. Like, she's unhinged. She is also super fucking smart. This is why we are here. The next door, they find this neighbor taking a bath who seemed to have been stealing Trevor's electricity. And it seems to be yet another dead end. But now, with the first name... They have enough information to get a court order for the records to be released for a foster child named Natalie. With that information, they go to the foster home where Natalie stayed before staying with Ernie. And here, this person can't remember it, like it was in 1982, but she took a picture of every single foster child their first night there. So she shows them this photo album, and Natalie is there. And they're asking, like, how long did she stay? Like, why did she leave? Because they have the record that she only stayed, like, a couple of nights. And the foster mom says that Natalie only stayed for a week because she seemed to have climbed on the top bunk and then pushed another foster child down. And at first, they were like, okay, maybe it was an accident, but then Natalie did it again. So they had to send her back. And then, you know, she was sent to another foster family, which ended up being Ernie's. And this foster mom said, usually the kids that come to a foster home, they're either damaged or broken. And Natalie, she was far from damaged. Natalie was broken. And just before they leave, one of the detectives asked the foster mom, was there ever any fascination between, like, Natalie and Bleach, possibly? And the mom says, yes, that was so fucking weird. Like, she was so shy. We only had her for seven days, but she would lose her shit, like, go absolutely psychotic any time I would use Bleach to wash the laundry. Just as that information is relayed to us, we see Natalie have a flashback. And the flashback is of her on one of the crime scenes. And she is seeing Grissom and Sarah. And Grissom touches Sarah's arm. It is nothing much. It's literally just like a second in passing. But to Natalie, that was like a mental moment where she registered these two are in a relationship. And then she got fixated onto the two of them. And now we see her in her workshop creating one of those miniature molds that looks suspiciously like Sarah Seidel. Next, we see a zoom in of her hitting a miniature car, even burning some of it, then hitting it some more with a hammer. With the information from the foster mom, Catherine and Grissom are now waiting for what we will soon learn is a ventriloquist show up on stage. And you're like, what is the context here? I was literally thinking, like, have they lost me? Like, I think they have lost me. What the fuck are we just watching? Because it's a grown-ass man with, like, a doll on stage literally making jokes that nobody is laughing at. But after that show, we realize that they are there because that is Natalie's dad. From him, through this flashback, we see Natalie playing with who we will learn is her sister in 1981. Natalie was six and Chloe was four. They were playing up in a tree house. And we see Chloe, the sister, just utter like, I love you, dad. And dad says like, oh, I love you too, honey. And Natalie makes eye contact with the dad and out of jealousy pushes her younger sister off that tree house. And the treehouse wasn't underneath the grass. It was literally concrete. So Chloe was dead on the spot. In order to then protect her daughter, the dad was rinsing that blood and washing that crime scene off with the bleach. Hence the fascination with bleach and each and every one of the crime scenes. We learn from the dad that soon after that, Natalie's and Chloe's mom has died. 
And now with both his wife and daughter dead, he couldn't take care of the second child and that's when he put Natalie up for adoption. Just as Catherine and Grissom are walking out of that casino after the interview with her dad, grown-ass Natalie is now walking into a lab, dressed as a cleaning lady, dropping another package off. And as Grissom returns to the lab, he puts into words the conclusion that he has made after speaking with her dad. You must think about what did that murder of her little sister look like to her from above. Whether or not you think it is an accident, she was from a higher up point. So the figures on the floor, her sister bleeding out to death, and her dad running to help her out and clean up the blood, they look like miniatures to her. They look like a lot smaller figures to her six-year-old brain. And as he walks into his own lab, he discovers a miniature on his desk. It's a miniature of an overturned red Mustang in the middle of a road. You don't really see the sign on the road. You don't know where it is. It seems like it's in the middle of the desert and there's a hand reaching out from underneath it just slowly moving, meaning the person is still alive. And when Grissom lifts the car, he finds the small figurine of Sarah Seidel underneath it. Just as he comes to the realization of who the miniature killer's next victim is, and goes to the reception to check who was in his office, realizing it was cleaning staff, we hear somebody utter Sarah's name inside of a parking lot. Grissom is now desperately trying to reach Sarah, but she isn't responding. So he sends Detective Brass, and at the parking lot, they realize that her car is there, the trunk of it is open, but Sarah isn't at the spot. The whole team is now on this, and they're analyzing this miniature, and they're thinking, how do you plan a car wreck? You need to wreck the car first. So they're looking for the vehicle identification number, But because this killer is so freaking precise, they get the license plate, like the vehicle identification number of the car in the miniature. And the car connects to this other case that Sarah and Grissom worked on a few weeks earlier. So they're going for the pictures of that crime scene. And in those pictures, we see Grissom exchange that little arm touch with Sarah. And also in those pictures, we see all of the people that are behind them, Natalie being right there in the focus. So now they know what she actually looks like. After seeing those pictures, Grissom comes to a realization. He has a light bulb moment saying, Natalie is blaming me, holding me responsible for Ernie's death. That is why this is happening. And he says, I took away the only person she ever loved, so she's going to do the same thing with me. And then leaves the room dramatically, and the whole team is just staring at him like, did he just confess to like this a sexual human being? He just confessed to love to like his, his colleague? What the fuck is going on? Grissom left that room dramatically in order to get Attorney General's waiver so that they get her address and they go and actually apprehend her. They get it, but she manages to run out once she hears them at the door. She's trying to leg it, you know, go down the fire exit, and it seems like she is in some form of trance again. She's running through the crowds, hallucinating, but then as she faints, Nick spots her and she gets taken in. The whole team is pissed now as she's in the interrogation room. Brass is saying, like, I'm going to give some bleach. I'm just going to spray it, put it on that table, splash it all over it. We're going to get this out of her. But then Grissom decides for a calmer approach. His asexual self walks in and he's just, you know, trying to please her, trying to talk to her genius self, right? Like, so nice to finally meet you. Oh my god, for 22 years. I've been doing this job for 22 years, okay? And you are by far the best ever at this. I even tried to do it myself, you know, like to try to replicate one of your miniatures and it's just so fucking hard. I mean, the way that you placed that car in the desert, like the way that you smashed it and then placed it over Sarah, I mean, the way that you killed her 
And at that moment, she stops and says, I didn't kill her. Realizing how much that information mattered to Grissom, she just loses it. She's like, this is all about her, her. And then goes into this trance, reciting the lyrics from I've got a pain in my sawdust. And Grissom tries to sit back down, tries to like shake her arms, be like, just tell me where Sarah is. Just tell me where Sarah is. Like, Come back to me. But she doesn't. So they have to do this on their own. We see in real time the rain pouring down over the real-life Red Ford Mustang that is just lying in the middle of Nevada desert as it's just showering over somebody's hand. And Sarah's hand reaches out from under the car, clawing at the mud. The blood is dripping from her own forehead. And soon, even though that miniature is a correct representation of her state at this moment, if she doesn't get up from underneath that car, she soon might be dead. In the parking garage where she was abducted from, now Catherine and Greg are speaking with a security guard. There was one, yet again blurry, security camera with a nice view of Sarah's car. They need to wait on the video feeds, but this security guard doesn't remember seeing Natalie, but he does recognize Sarah, so he tells them about the usual time that she gets into that parking lot, so they can kind of triangulate and spot the time frame of when she was abducted. While they are trying to get the time of the abduction in order to figure out how far in the desert she would be, they also do need a more specific location. So inside of Natalie's flat, they're going through her sketchbooks. Here they won't get a location just as yet, but Nick, looking at the sketchbooks of how precise that scene that is stuck in Natalie's head of Grissom and Sarah on a crime scene is notes in his brain that, you know, Natalie didn't have a sketchbook in the pictures that they have seen of her, just like behind the police tape. So it means like she must have this photographic memory, meaning that Sarah's location is probably locked into her own brain, which isn't good for them, because if she didn't note anything down, they're fucked. As she is now completely unresponsive in the police interrogation, Grissom is observing the weather forecast, and it is said to be raining throughout the whole night. So he does what he knows that Natalie probably had in mind. He takes a jug of water and pours it over the car in that miniature. And sure enough, that hand soon stops moving once it's completely underwater. Still in Natalie's flat, Nick is going through her computer to check her previous searches to see if she has searched for other routes inside of the desert. And they realize that she has. And then, looking through her car, processing her car, they actually collect like this seed sample. So they send it to the lab to figure out where the fuck this could have been. And now let me explain this because I found this complicated when I like first watched this. So there's Natalie's car, there's Sarah's car, and then there is the third car, which is the Mustang underneath which Sarah is. So Sarah wasn't kidnapped in her own car. It was Natalie's car that she then used to drive her there and then drive off. Cool, cool. I just wanted to clarify that because I got so lost when it came to these fucking cars. They figure out the last trip that Natalie took in her own car was about 34 miles one way. So they are searching all of the areas, all of the fields, by the choppers, with the helicopters, with the cars driving there themselves. Now the team garage has finally had that CCTV footage and they realize that Natalie's car was headed west when she left the garage, sort of helping them, you know, narrow down that search field even more. Inspecting Sarah's car, they find one of those taser barbs in the tire of Sarah's car. So they figure, okay, if it was used to make sure that she can't leave from this location, it might have been used to taste Sarah herself. And sure enough, we see it in the flashback. We see Sarah inside of a lift headed to the park. And on a call with Grissom, who is telling her of the miniature killer, he's telling her that this is a female, that they're going to go and question the dead. 
And just as she opens up her trunk to get something out of it, Natalie calls out her name, she tases her and then puts her in the trunk of her own car. We then see Sarah waking up inside of the trunk and because this freaking genius doesn't interact with humans except when she tases them with the freaking barb, well, she had left it basically inside of Sarah's vest. So Sarah, with her teeth, pulls that barb out of her vest and then tries to basically flip it towards her hands that are tied in the back to get out of her ties and she succeeds. She also notices now, completely released, there is a hole between the back seat and the trunk. So she's trying to cut through it in order to be able to push that seat forward and to possibly like attack. And before she does that, she even opens up the trunk to figure out where they're driving. And that pops up on the dashboard for Natalie, but... We are led to believe that she doesn't actually see it. It is such a fucking intense moment. I was like, Sarah, shut that thing down or jump out of it, like one or the other. Well, she decides to actually go for the backseat approach. So she slams that trunk down, makes a hole in that seat until she's all the way through and she does not wait a split second before she tries to take over the steering wheel from Natalie, who is just like in a trance, just looking forward, driving, and doesn't even see this happen. There's a scuffle between the two of them. Natalie pushes her off. Sarah slams her head against the glass and she even manages to jump out of the car. But when she jumps out of the car, she's kind of like really weak and unconscious. And we see Natalie stop the car and then lean over her. Back with the team, as they're examining Natalie's car, they find that taser barb. And that tells them that Sarah managed to unlock her zip ties and maybe she got out of the trunk. So if she did, what if she's not underneath that car inside of this desert? But Grissom tells them that that doesn't mean much. Maybe there was a struggle, but he saw it in Natalie's eyes that she has completed that miniature, that Sarah is definitely under that car. In that moment, Hodges, the lab technician, walks in and he had examined pollen from Natalie's car realizing that it comes from the Red Rock Canyon area, sort of like narrowing it more and more down. We then have a flashback of what happened after Natalie and Sarah struggled in the car. We see that Sarah is now lying in the back seat. She's zip-tied again, and Natalie is just sort of sprinkling water into her face and trying to get her to drink some. Sarah, in the back seat, is trying to talk to her. She's talking about how she knows that she's behind the miniatures, how great her work is, how she has just heard that she actually works in the lab as the cleaning crew as well, trying to relate to her to say that they have a lot in common, that Sarah was a foster kid too, that she has also lost her father. And Natalie says, he didn't love me more than Grissom loved you. To which Sarah is kind of confused, like, Grissom loves me. What are you saying, Natalie? Natalie, what did you put in the water bottle? And we see Sarah pass out again. Inside of the desert, you see Sarah being put underneath that car. She's lying on her stomach with her hand and arm stretched out to one side. We see the crushed car crushing her, especially her arm. And then Natalie just leaves her behind. Once she's satisfied with her doing, she goes into her car and drives away. In Natalie's flat, Nick is now pissed. And he recalls this time when he spoke to Sarah. It was like a different crime scene, but Nick had just been rescued from being buried alive. Listen, every single team member was attacked at some point. And this is why I hate this trope in general, but this is why I love the miniature killer plotline, because it is single-handedly the best execution of that kind of trope, where, you know... team member is always in danger, they're about to die, etc, etc. So Sarah and Nick are sharing an emotional moment. And Sarah tells him, it wasn't your day to die. When it's your day, it's your day. And Nick just like is teary eyed, he gets up and he sees on this very visible piece of paper 
This phone number that Natalie wrote down for the Desert Diamond Auto Yard. Seems like she has a photographic memory, but the bitch can't remember a phone number. But here they go to that yard and this random person confirms that yes, Natalie was there, said that she was an artist and she bought a red Mustang off of them a couple of weeks ago. Not only did she buy it, but because this is a scrapyard, they towed that car to her and they towed it to Icebox Canyon. So now all of the cars, all of the helicopters are just searching that area. Greg does spot the car from the helicopter, but once they're there, they realize that Sarah isn't under it. It is the right car, but Sarah seems to have somehow gotten up and managed to get from underneath it. Her vest is there, so she has definitely been there. And Grissom and Catherine are on foot, so they are now looking through binoculars, and Grissom sees that she has been leaving rocks behind. She's like, oh my god, this is Sarah, smart, super smart. What they don't also realize, but we see in real time, is that she has taken one of the mirrors, one of the reflective mirrors as well. The one, and I think this is such a poetic justice, the exact same one for which Natalie was observing her in the back seat. So the team is now following literally the breadcrumbs, but in forms of the rocks, trying to search for Sarah on foot. Because a whole day has passed, so they have no idea how far she has gotten. And another thing to bear in mind, that it isn't pouring down anymore. So for the past day, the sun has been blasting, meaning that she didn't have any water in the past at least 24 hours in this desert, just walking on foot. And in the flashback, we see exactly how she managed to escape that car. We see her smashing that rearview mirror. So what she did as the water was trickling down into the car, she would take a huge breath and then go underneath the water. She manages to smash that rearview mirror and then use that to basically get her hand from underneath the car. So now she only has that reflective light, she has a bandana over her head, and her arm seems to be broken because it was literally crushed by a freaking car, so she has done uh, this makeshift sling, and she is walking through the desert disorientated, just falling forward and then trying to get up. And at some point, while she still has enough strength, she goes onto this huge rock in order to see the forest in order to try to orientate herself and it's just impossible. She's literally in the middle of nowhere. She can't even see any roads nearby. And the team, who has by this point been following her footprints and also the rocks, well, realized that soon enough they had disappeared. Maybe there were no rocks nearby for her to put them as these little breadcrumbs. They even spot somebody else's shoe and then start digging and realize this was somebody else's body. So they report that for this person to be transported to the hospital. And it's kind of like all in that form of reality sinking in. Like, what if this is Sarah? What if the next body that they find is her? And we see her in the middle of that forest just falling down for one last time. As she's on the ground, Nick, from inside of a car that was driving on the road nearby, says, stop, 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 stop. I have seen something blinking in the distance. Can you drive this way? And sure enough, he just drives to the right. And after a couple of miles, I don't know how far she was, but he managed to find her because she was smart, because it wasn't her day to die. So they get the medical department, they get the whole S helicopter, and Grissom, of course, walks in with her to hold her hand. And she flusters her eyes and opens them because Sarah Seidel cannot die. Okay, she's immortal. Lesbians are immortal. That was <laughs> the moral of this story. Oh, God, my dumb ass put in the script. I thought she won't make it, but that spin-off had to happen. Like, why is there a spin-off of the CSI? I mean, I guess the real fans would watch it, right, Maya? She says after she has made two hours on this episode. <laughs> on a single CSI plot. 
So how this saga ends is in like a random ass episode that obviously isn't fully committed to Natalie. But in season nine, I think we see Grissom receiving a letter that states that Natalie, who has been held in this mental health institution, is to be transferred to prison. So there's a hearing about this that Grissom attends to. And during this hearing, the DA questions his, like, do we imprison people who have different diagnoses, like MS, for example, she needs to remain here. But we hear from Natalie herself on the stand that she now feels normal. And she feels that even though she was diagnosed with catatonic schizophrenia, the meds have helped that go away. And after hearing this, the ADA asks Grissom to testify because he was the only person in that room when she had a psychotic break. So, you know, they are going to make sure that everybody knows that he is not a mental health specialist, but just as an observer to testify to her behavior. And here before that testifying, Grissom is inside of a laundry room of this mental health hospital where Natalie is just putting, adding bleach to the wash just as she did because she's still fixated on this motherfucking bleach. And she's talking completely normally, like there's no trace of Natalie that was back then. And Grissom tells her the only time he saw her, she wasn't herself. So he wanted to see for himself the person that she really was now. And she, of course, thinks that he wants to make sure that she goes to jail and, you know, is asking, is Sarah going to speak at the hearing too? But Grissom tells her she doesn't work there anymore. And Natalie's like, oh my God, is it because something I did? Like, bitch, like, the world doesn't revolve around you. Like, egoistic or shit. But we also see Natalie pouring bleach over this laundry, saying that she has by now been used to working with what she fears the most. And by doing that, it strips the power that it has over her. She tells Grissom that she is truly sorry, but she is going to understand if he doesn't believe her because of her psychopathic traits. <laughs> Which is just the awkwardest fucking conversation. It's like, I kind of really wanted to kill the love of your life, but like, it's fine if you don't want to forgive me. Bitch, this is why I have no such forgiveness in my fucking heart. I'm like, bitch, you use your bleach forever and ever here. Shut the fuck up. So we see Grissom testifying, saying that he's not a mental health professional. He did only interview her once and then she became non-responsive. He said her eyes weren't focusing on him. She didn't seem to have the ability to focus. But today, she makes the eye contact. She answers questions in a logical manner. She even expresses remorse. But then the DA says, well, are you trying to punish her? Because, you know, she did attack your co-worker, wanted to kill her. And you seem to have been violently shaking her back in that room. You were frustrated. You were afraid for her. But he says he doesn't care about revenge. He simply has no stake at the outcome of this, whether or not she stays here or goes to prison. And his final line to Natalie is, I'm trying to believe that people can change, but I don't know if they can. We then see her being transferred to prison. So it was in the end approved. And as she is moving, Grissom is left alone in what used to be her hospital room. And he sees this crack in the door. And once he lifts it, there seems to be another miniature doll. And as he lifts that floorboard, the floorboard is the ceiling. And the little miniature that looks suspiciously like her is hanging from it. That is where the story leaves off. It is just implied that she was planning to maybe hang herself, but... It never picked up. Like, I don't think that there was another episode done on her. So we don't really know what she did. Like, did she go through with it? Or will she reappear again one day? Maybe from prison. Maybe she'll find a way to make this like little scrappy miniature with the objects that she finds in jail. 
what do you think? Because I think that because it wasn't mentioned, because we don't have a final conclusion, this isn't the last that we will see of Natalie motherfucking Davis or whatever her last name is, the miniature killer. This plot I obsess over. Like, this is my, you know, whatever, eggs and bacon, the cow's moo, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. This was it for me. When I first saw it, I was like, this is impeccable. Why are all the shows not doing this hard work to showcase something like this to us? Like, if you want to do the fucking trope, you do it right. And according to the fandom, which is, you know, one of those internet pages that does analysis on all of these, Um, They have smartly noticed that if she does commit suicide this way, all of the modus operandi of her murders are going to spell the word bleach. So, blood, liquid nicotine, electric, asphyxiation, car crash, and then hanging. Uh, I think we're pushing it a bit there (laughs) because, like, you know... It isn't really a modus operandi like liquid nicotine, blood, but hey, sure, I just wanted to include it there because the fascination with bleach was real, okay? Some people get healthy freaking fascinations. They're like, yeah, I'm gonna eat figs for the rest of my life. And this woman, of course, something like this left a huge impression on her because everything and everybody looked like miniatures to her. It just everything connects and wraps up and it's just so much work that got done here. Whoever wrote this plot, please write my life story. That's it. That's all I have to say. So I shall be seeing you guys (laughs) hopefully later this week for that 100, 100. And uh, until then, keep questioning everything, fictional plots and non-fictional plots. And by doing that... (laughs) Keep doing what? Making this world a better place. One motive at a time. Bye. Bye, fuckers.